Welcome to session number 36 of Old Testament Survey. Uh, we've had uh, quite a spring and summer. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's been wonderful having so many of you uh, gathered together literally around the world uh, to uh, take part in these, um, uh, these exercises. Uh, it, it's been uh, um, a great encouragement for me as a teacher uh, to have you there. Uh, and I know some parts of it are difficult, uh, but you have stuck with it, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm touched. <laughs> I'm very happy. Okay, today, as we go, we'll be in uh, Second Kings, and I'm going to begin at uh, chapter 9 of Second Kings. We'll go from 9 through 17 of uh, Second Kings, which takes us down to the uh, end of the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, so we begin around, uh, let's see, Jehu reigns from about 841 to 814. He has a nice long reign, uh, quite an evil character, but uh, he, did, he did some good. Uh, it didn't last. Uh, and uh, after, uh, uh, after Jehu's time, everything is downhill in the north until it finally uh, collapses under uh, a series of Assyrian uh, attacks. Now the Assyrians, just so we got some, uh, some geographical context here, uh, the Assyrians were centered in northern Mesopotamia modern Iraq. Uh, their, uh, uh, their capital city was Nineveh. Uh, there have been Assyrians uh, first in the city of Asher and then expanding in the northern, northwestern Mesopotamian Valley uh, from probably 1400 or so BC, uh, but they don't really become a, uh, a great power, a serious player in the region uh, until after the time of Solomon. Uh, uh, and uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the late 900s, early 800s BC, we start seeing the Assyrian Empire um, flexing their muscles and uh, becoming a regional power. Now, when I say the Assyrians were a regional power, I, uh, I don't mean this in a good way. Uh, they were essentially uh, a protection racket. The Assyrians were the mafia. Uh, they would um, uh, go out every spring when kings go to war, uh, the, surround the first city they came to, uh, demand all the valuables and a bunch of hostages and the promise of uh, more tribute uh, forever and ever, uh, or the Assyrians would destroy the city. Uh, and if a city would ever fail to pay the tribute, uh, the city would be burned and all of the people massacred. Uh, the Assyrians were not an empire in the sense of providing roads and foreign policy and uh, military protection for the people and uh, trade regulation or anything like that. Uh, uh, they didn't uh, provide what we would think of as government services. Uh, the, the concept had no meaning in the ancient world. But the Assyrians were particularly evil. Uh, they were, um, they were armed robbery uh, on a national scale. Very, very evil people. Uh, and as they grew in their influence, they're, they're going to become the dominant force uh, in the Middle East prior to the rise of the real empires. And the, the real empires are also going to arise in Mesopotamia. Uh, the first will be Babylon, and then after that will be Persia. Uh, uh, Persia becomes the really large, really dominant uh, force in the region 
that actually continues to be a dominant force in that region today. Today we call it Iran, uh, the Persia. So that sequence, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, uh, will be the great powers of the East, uh, North and East, uh, which will interact with Israel's history in some very important ways. Now, you may be asking, uh, well, what happens with uh, Asia Minor, what we call today Turkey? Well, nothing was happening in Asia Minor in these days. Uh, there were a, a variety of small um, kingdoms or fiefdoms or warlords uh, in Asia Minor, uh, none of whom ended up being very important, and it simply doesn't provide any counterbalance for Israel. In the south, Egypt is the big geographic area. But from the time of, uh, of Solomon, essentially, uh, the uh, uh, Egyptians uh, were of no particular significance. Uh, a fellow at the end of, um, of Solomon's reign, uh, when uh, uh, Jeroboam or Rehoboam divided the kingdoms, uh, an Egyptian king by the name of Shishak took the opportunity to sack Jerusalem. Uh, which was on the order of a raid. And that happens around 930 BC. And that, by the way, is when the Ark of the Covenant actually got to Egypt. The Ark of the Covenant did not go to Ethiopia. It went to Egypt. Uh, Indiana Jones was right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that, that did, in fact, happen. Um, Indiana Jones is wrong about virtually everything else, but that part is correct. Um, so Israel, Israel and Judah are really very small countries. And they're surrounded by a bunch of other little bitty countries, Edom and Moab and the, the Amalekites and the uh, uh, various other rites uh, surrounding them. The, the most important nearby player during all of this period of history was uh, Syria. Now, Syria shouldn't be confused with Assyria. Assyria is the great power uh, to the northeast in Mesopotamia. Syria is the, the little Aramean power located uh, with its headquarters in Damascus. Uh, the, uh, uh, the country is still to this day called Syria. It runs between approximately the Euphrates River uh, and the, um, uh, uh, the mountains, the Golan Heights and Mount Hermon that separates it from uh, Lebanon and from Israel. Uh, Syria is uh, uh, really quite a large fertile area. It's uh, well watered, it has a good river that flows through Damascus out of Mount Hermon and down into uh, the flatland before finally going around in the north to the Mediterranean. Uh, and this is a large fertile area. It's part of the, what we call the Fertile Crescent. Uh, the Syrians uh, spoke Aramaic and their, their civilization grew up alongside Israel. And during the period of the kings, uh, there is uh, a continued interaction between Syria and Israel and Judah. And sometimes uh, Syria would be an ally of either Israel or Judah against the other, and sometimes Israel and Judah would be allies against Syria, and sometimes uh, the Assyrians, the big power, uh, would try to get pick one of them off and alliances would be made. Uh, it's a complex thing uh, that I'm not going to try to sort out for you. As, as you read the Bible, recognize that all of these political things are happening in the background and they often provide the, uh, the mechanism, the uh, the historical event by which 
either the wrath of God or the blessing of God uh, is uh, displayed. So let's uh, let's jump into the uh, into the uh, PowerPoint again. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, uh, Good King Jehu, who is actually a very bad king. Uh, the this is in Second Kings chapters nine and ten. Uh, Jehu, as you might recall, is uh, uh, memorialized for us on uh, a thing called the Shalmaneser Stele. Sometime after 841, uh, we see Jehu paying tribute to the Assyrian king Shalmaneser. Uh, so we know, we know his place, and uh, we actually have very good dates for uh, King Jehu of uh, Israel. Uh, his reign is uh, 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 inaugurated with his anointing uh, by uh, 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 by Elisha. Actually, it's one of uh, one of Elisha's uh, disciples uh, who does the anointing of uh, King Jehu. And immediately after this anointing, Jehu begins to uh, assassinate kings. Uh, and he's going to assassinate the families of the king, uh, the uh, assassinations of uh, King Joram of Israel at the same time as the assassination of King Ahaziah of Judah. Uh, Joram and Ahaziah were allies at this time, and uh, it, it was God's intention to break that up. Uh, and so Jehu personally king, uh, killed uh, uh, King uh, Joram, uh, and uh, uh, was present at the assassination of uh, Ahaziah. Uh, following that, um, uh, where is uh, good old uh, yeah King uh, uh, King Ahab? Uh, is already dead, of course. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, widow of uh, King Ahab is uh, uh, Jezebel. And in the middle of uh, chapter 9, beginning at uh, verse 30, we see uh, Jehu confronting Jezebel. And this is a fascinating passage. There's a, a, an awful lot that's left unsaid. Uh, there's a great deal here that we really don't know. Uh, but we know it's uh, uh, probably fairly important stuff. Um, in um, verse 30, Jehu came to Jezreel, which was uh, Jezebel's capital city. And Jezebel heard of it, and so she painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out the windows. The, uh, the painted eyes and the uh, made-up uh, uh, hairdo uh, were the actions of a prostitute. Uh, what we think was going on here. She looked out the window and uh, she said to Jehu as he entered the gate, is it peace, O Zimri, you murderer of your master? To be the murderer of his master, means he's the assassin of the previous king, uh, was in, uh, in a Phoenician or pagan uh, worldview, a, uh, a very good thing. This was a praiseworthy thing. Evil is called good, and good is called evil, very much like our modern world. Uh, and, uh, 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 Jezebel was complimenting Jehu on his masterful assassination of the previous king. Uh, she was, uh, and at the same time, she's dressed up and made up like a prostitute, my guess is that Jezebel was hoping to seduce Jehu. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, uh, Jehu looked up at the windows and says, anybody up there who's on my side? And two or three eunuchs looked out at him. And he said, throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood spattered on the wall. Uh, and uh, uh, the horses trampled on her. Uh, Jehu, meanwhile, went in and had dinner. 
Uh, so we can see this is a real sensitive guy. Um, uh, Jezebel, the Bible doesn't even bother to mention that she died, uh, but she did, of course. Uh, when they went to bury her, they found that there was nothing left, uh, but a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Thus, to fulfill the words of Elijah the Tishbite, the dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel. So this was not a pretty end for Jezebel, but a, um, uh, uh, frankly, it's, it's a fitting end. Uh, uh, Jehu is a man of uh, very low character, uh, but at least he did this right. Uh, and it's a, it's a grim thing. Jehu begins then to uh, slaughter the uh, descendants of uh, Ahab. Uh, 70 here and 42 in another spot. The middle of chapter 10, we see this uh, <laughs> fascinating treachery. Uh, Jehu announces that uh, where Ahab had uh, served Baal a little, uh, Jehu would serve him much. And there was going to be a great big worship ceremony for Baal. And all of the worshipers of Baal were to come from all over and get into a great big tent, and everybody was going to have a wonderful time and a big feast, and there would be lots of there'd be partying and drinking, and it would be great fun. And he also made sure uh, that there were guards at the door uh, to see to it that no sneaky uh, worshipers of the Lord managed to get in. Uh, and once that was done. He put 80 soldiers around the outside of the tent and um, uh, said, now go on in and kill them all, kill everybody. Uh, and anybody that escapes, whoever's responsible will pay with his life. Well, they all died. Uh, and thus, Jehu became the undisputed king of Israel. And he did manage to wipe Baal worship out from Israel, at least on the surface. Uh, underneath, we find that uh, the worship of Baal and Asherah continues to be a problem in, uh, in Israel and in Judah up until the exile to Babylon. Uh, however, uh, uh, Jehu, although he had wiped out uh, Baal worship more or less, uh, did not turn away from the sins of uh, his great-great-grandfather, uh, 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 Jeroboam, that he still kept the golden calves at Dan and Bethel set up. Uh, so this problem will continue throughout his life. And because of that, uh, he, he cannot be considered a godly king. Uh, he's uh, uh, the least bad of the kings of Israel, <laughs> uh, if, uh, if we can say it that way. They were all grimly bad, uh, uh, but Jehu was perhaps of, of a bad lot. He's the best of them, uh, which I realize is not much praise. Okay, uh, in uh, verse 32, we see the final judgment on Jehu. In those days, the Lord began to cut off parts of Israel. Hazael defeated them throughout the territory of Israel, from the Jordan eastward, all the land of Gilead, the Gadites and the Reubenites and the Manassites, from Aror, which is by the valley of the Arnon, that is Gilead and Bashan. Now, if you're not familiar with the maps, it, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, but what this means is that all of the Transjordan, everything east of the Jordan, uh, was taken uh, by the Syrians. Hazael was the king of uh, Damascus over the Syrians. Uh, and the, the point is being made. In uh, Jehu's reign, God began to slice off chunks of Israel. Judah remained in the south, uh, but first the Syrians and later the Assyrians will begin to take land and uh, power and uh, economic uh, possibilities. And, and finally, the Assyrians will impose uh, a, uh, 
a, a vassalage over uh, the north. In let me see here. In uh, uh, Judah at this time, uh, we've got a usurper, uh, a lady by the name of Athaliah. Athaliah is actually the uh, 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 the daughter of uh, uh, the daughter of Jezebel, uh, and uh, uh, she is uh, uh, not a not a good uh, good person. She ends up as a uh, a queen of uh, 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 Judah. Uh, together with, let me get this right, uh, uh, Athaliah is the, the mother of Ahaziah. I'm, uh, I'm missing it. Okay, Athaliah. She's the granddaughter uh, of Ahab and Jezebel. Yeah, granddaughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, and, uh, uh, she married the king of Judah in a diplomatic uh, marriage. Uh, and uh, oh, she ends up uh, uh, taking the uh, the throne of Israel, she usurped the the throne for uh, several years uh, uh, for uh, for a while. Uh, the uh, uh, young son uh, is uh, uh, Joash. Uh, that's the uh, the son of Athaliah, who is uh, just a baby at the time. He was protected. Um, for uh, for a while until uh, finally Jehoiada the priest had him anointed as king. Uh, it was still difficult. Uh, uh, Joash became the king under the mentorship of Jehoiada. Uh, you know, here in chapters uh, eleven and twelve, uh, Joash tried to be a good king. Uh, Athaliah was no help, uh, but uh, uh, Joash tried to be a good king, but it was. Uh, uh, very difficult for him to overcome the uh, inertia of uh, a, a whole body of priests who had no particular motivation to serve the Lord or to keep the temple clean uh, or to uh, reinstitute the sacrificial system in Israel. He tried to clean out the temple uh, and even raised money to do that, but the uh, the priests were so corrupt, uh, they used the money for their own purposes uh, and never got around to uh, uh, refurbishing the temple. Uh, it never got done. The work never got done uh, throughout his life. But Joash tried. After Jehoiada died, uh, uh, Joash was not a strong king. Uh, and uh, so we, we see his reign and uh, the end of chapter 12. Uh, in uh, Israel, uh, we see a, a fifth dynasty in chapter 13 with a couple of kings, Jehoahaz and uh, another Joash. Uh, this Joash is not related to the Joash in uh, Judah, uh, but they have the same name just to confuse us. Uh, and that's all through uh, uh, chapter 13. Chapter 13, we're also given the uh, the note of the, uh, the death, finally, of... Uh, Elisha, uh, and um, uh, that is noted for us. In uh, chapter 14, uh, we see King Amaziah. He's a weak king. Uh, if, not, uh, if not evil, he is, uh, he is a weak king. He's not a very impressive uh, king. Uh, he's followed in chapter 15 uh, by uh, a character named Azariah, who is more commonly referred to as Uzziah. At the same time that Uzziah is the king, well, actually during Amaziah and Uzziah, there is a king in Israel uh, who reigned for a good long time. Um, let me see here if I've got this written down. Uh, a good long time, a Jeroboam the uh, second, who reigned from about. Let me see if I have this written down. I should. Ah, ooh, where is it? Jeroboam. Yeah, forty-one years. Uh, and uh, 
I don't know why it's so far out of order, but there it is. Uh, Jeroboam reigned for 41, 41 years. Um, uh, King Uzziah reigned for 52 years. Uh, so the north and the south uh, for virtually half a century uh, had uh, stable kings. Neither one was assassinated. They reigned a long time. Uh, historically, uh, uh, and uh, uh, from a uh, study of uh, the rest of the world, we know that uh, kings who reign a long time generally have uh, stable nations. Uh, Israel and Judah were mostly at peace during this time with one another. Uh, there were other problems on the outside, but this was a, a long period of peace and prosperity. In the north, this is going to be the, the period where the, uh, the prophets begin. And so the first prophet we'll look at here in uh, just a couple of slides is Joel, uh, who uh, uh, prophesies destruction in the north. Uh, and he's doing that during a time of uh, health and wealth and prosperity, and everybody's happy. Uh, and, uh, this is often uh, the case. Uh, in the south, King Uzziah, uh, who we're not going to see very much of, uh, was quite a good king, and uh, his reign of 52 years can be thought of as a uh, golden age. So Jehoahaz, Joash, 29 years of Amaziah, then Azariah, Uzziah, uh, uh, for uh, 52 years. Uh, Uzziah will die in 740 BC. Uh, and we're pretty sure about that date. That's the year that Isaiah, the prophet, uh, had his vision in the temple. So in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Uh, that's a very famous uh, passage. Uh, and uh, we see in that passage in Isaiah, the very great king Uzziah compared with the greatest king, God himself. So in the year that the great king died, I saw the king who doesn't die. So Uzziah put together a golden age, but uh, eventually, of course, he died. Uh, and... Um, Leading, uh, leading up to uh, uh, Uzziah, we've got some ups and downs. Uh, Amaziah was a very weak king. Go on to uh, uh, this next line, the last of the uh, uh, great kings. You've got Jeroboam II, uh, followed by a, a very evil guy, Zechariah, Zechariah who uh, managed to stay in power for four verses or six months. Uh, and, uh, he was assassinated. Uh, the uh, last four chaotic dynasties of Israel are uh, listed for us uh, uh, here in chapter 15, beginning at verse 13. Uh, we get just half a, half a chapter here of, uh, of kings. Uh, Shalom uh, is barely worth uh, mentioning. He managed to survive for uh, two verses or one month. Uh, you know, he's not a very important character. Menachem lasted 10 years. Pekahiah lasted uh, two years. And uh, Pekah is the, uh, the best of a bad lot and managed to survive for 20 years. On Pekah's watch, about 732 BC, uh, we see the invasion of a very, very important character by the name of uh, Tiglath Pileser. I know that's easy for me to say. Tiglath Pileser was the first Assyrian king uh, to actually make a trip to uh, Samaria. Uh, he, uh, he, he didn't take the city of Samaria, uh, but he uh, uh, destroyed uh, several other cities and uh, took large numbers of the people of Israel, the northern kingdom, uh, into captivity in Assyria. Uh, we don't know for sure what happened to the, uh, uh, to the exiles in Assyria. Uh, the, uh, 
Uh, tradition has it uh, that they were randomly split up and sent off into all the four corners of the Assyrian domains uh, where they intermarried with local people and simply became Assyrians. Uh, there are there are some traditions of the uh, uh, Israelite exiles maintaining some of their previous traditions, but frankly, there was there was very little of that left. Um, uh, Seven uh, thirty two B.C. Israel invaded, and that takes us up into a couple of kings of uh, Judah. Uh, Jotham uh, was a was a good guy, and uh, we're going to see him in uh, chapter fifteen, beginning at verse uh, thirty two, second year of Pika, uh, which would have been seven fifty B.C. Uh, we see Jotham reigning for 16 years, and he is followed by King Ahaz. Uh, Ahaz is also going to reign for 16 years, uh, from uh, 732 down to 715 BC. Uh, Ahaz will have a, a co-regency with uh, uh, King Hezekiah, his son. Uh, so we've got a, a good guy, Jotham, uh, who really couldn't do much that was very good. He tried, but uh, uh, he, he wasn't that, that much. Uh, and uh, Ahaz reigned in Judah. Ah Ahaz is going to be important uh, because of his interactions with uh, Isaiah. Ahaz was a, a weak king. Uh, he was evil, of course. They all were. Uh, <clears throat> well, not all of them, but Ahaz was just not a good guy. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he was trying to be pragmatic and making uh, alliances with uh, foreign powers. Uh, and Isaiah has to uh, routinely talk him out of that. Uh, don't make an alliance with this one. Don't make an alliance with that one. It's on Ahaz's watch uh, that we see tiglath Pileser invading the north. Uh, and then uh, later on, uh, we're, we're going to see a, a character by the name of uh, Sargon uh, invading and uh, destroying the city of uh, Samaria. Uh, so that will end the uh, the northern uh, uh, the northern kingdom. Uh, Ahaz reigns in Judah, and uh, the note of the uh, fall of Samaria is in chapter 17 and verse six. The ninth year of Hosea, the last king of uh, Israel, uh, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and on the Habor, the river of Gozan and the cities of the Medes. So it was, uh, it was the Assyrian king, uh, by this time Shalmaneser, uh, who scattered the people of uh, Samaria. All that was left in the north uh, were uh, the peasants, uh, just the, the people who worked the land. All of the elites, the landowners, the royal family, uh, the uh, 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 the, the people who are behind the power of the royal family, the, the nobility of Israel was all scattered throughout uh, uh, the Assyrian Empire in a wide variety of places. Uh, and they simply, for all practical purposes, became Gentiles in uh, 722 BC. And let me see what I've got here. I should have. At this point, I should have lots and lots of good stuff, do I? Oh, yes, I've got something later on that will be helpful. Now we come to the book of Joel. And uh, Pastor Joel, this is, this is your book. It's all, all about you. No, not really. Uh, this is a, a little book that, uh, uh, just three chapters long, is found in the Minor Prophets. 
if you're uh, looking around in your Old Testament, wondering where is the book of Joel, you'll find it uh, after Daniel. Daniel comes after Ezekiel. If you find Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, then you'll find Daniel. Then come the minor prophets. Hosea is the first in the list. And we'll get to Hosea in a minute. He is followed by Joel. And a little background on Joel. Joel is hard to find because it, it only takes up a couple of pages in our Bibles. Uh, but uh, Joel is probably fairly important. Uh, Joel probably wrote during the reign of King Uzziah, during the first half of the 8th century BC. Uh, this was a time of unparalleled prosperity for Judah and Israel. Uh, the two kingdoms were expanding. Uh, this, was a, this was a good time. Uh, uh, Uzziah uh, spent a great deal of time on uh, internal affairs. Uh, so lots of expansion. Uh, and it's during the period of uh, Judah's, uh, we can call it comfortable maturity during Israel or during Judah's golden age, that God raised up the great writing prophets. Uh, because in spite of uh, Israel's prosperity and peace, in spite of Judah's uh, prosperity and peace, she had fallen away from the Lord. She had walked away from God. Uh, and that's what the, uh, the little book of Joel is designed to try to fix. You know, whether something like that can ever be fixed or not is a, is a good question. Uh, the authorship of Joel is uh, argued about. We don't know anything about him, really, except what we find in the book, uh, which is uh, un not too unusual for the minor prophets. Most of the minors are um, uh, little known actors. We don't find them elsewhere in the Bible, and we don't find them elsewhere in history. Uh, we learn about them from uh, the books that they write. Uh, they were accepted by the uh, godly people of Israel at the time that they were written. The people of God recognized these books as uh, works of prophecy that uh, flowed from the authority that had been established first by Moses, then by Elijah. Uh, so following the deaths of Elijah, well, the translation of Elijah, the death of Elisha, um, uh, we see uh, uh, the, the prophet Joel, who was operating in the same mold. It's very likely that Joel was a product of the schools of the prophets uh, that were established by uh, the prophet Elisha. Uh, uh, these schools of the prophets uh, were groups of young men uh, who were learning what there was of the Bible at that time, what there was known of theology at that time. Uh, they were learning to hear the voice of God and to teach the people. That's, that's what prophecy was primarily about. And one of the most important elements of prophecy for this Old Testament uh, period uh, was the ability to recognize the truth. This is always a problem in, uh, in, our, uh, in our teaching, uh, recognizing the truth. Just because an idea sounds good to me doesn't make it true. Uh, the important thing is that an idea is true to the Word of God. Uh, by God's standard, uh, is my idea true? And if it passes that test, uh, then it can be passed on to the people of God. Well, the people of God were learning to recognize the truth when they saw it. Uh, and so by extension, they could recognize a lie when they saw uh, the 
uh, the ideas of Baal worship were very attractive. They were nicely packaged. They were very professionally pulled off with, with a very large cult and a very large following and great sacrifices. And there were lots of fun for everybody. Uh, uh, and so uh, it was very popular with people who didn't know the truth. The same thing is true in our modern world. When a generation grows up that doesn't know the truth, lies are very attractive. Uh, uh, the, the modern uh, worldly lies are extraordinarily attractive to a, a wide number of people. Uh, this is true in America. I know it's true in Europe. Uh, I know that it's true in the Philippines. Uh, these, um, uh, these modern ideas are not biblical. They are not godly and they are not good. Uh, uh, every idea needs to be held captive to the word of God. That's what the that's what the schools of the prophets were designed to do. I think that's how Joel came up. We know that he lived and worked in Judah. He was uh, mainly a Jerusalem guy. This picture in the background uh, shows the uh, uh, way up there. Let's see if I got it. Okay, you should be able to see my pointer there. Uh, the uh, Dormition Abbey, the, the, the plunger-shaped uh, church building there is the Dormition Abbey. It's kind of a silly thing. It, uh, celebrates the uh, uh, Sleeping Beauty uh, uh, era of uh, the Virgin Mary, uh, kind of a strange thing. And interestingly, right next to the Dormition Abbey is this great big tall minaret. Uh, when the Muslims uh, took Jerusalem back in the uh, 600s AD, one of the first things they did was to begin building, building mosques everywhere. Uh, and uh, there's the mosque on uh, Mount Zion next to the Dormition Abbey. It's always a taller mosque. Anyway, um, that's Jerusalem. That's Joel's uh, hometown. He uh, seemed to know quite a bit about the geography of the land. He had a ministry uh, that was closely associated with the temple, apparently. Uh, and uh, he seems to be a man with uh, some maturity. Uh, he's been observing people and making notes on uh, their times and their behaviors for, for a good long time. Uh, he apparently had had a, uh, a ministry in Judah uh, for a long time and was, was relatively popular. So this is what we know. His, uh, his writing, this little book of Joel, uh, has a, a great precision of thought. Uh, so very interesting stuff going on here. And uh, he lays out uh, a key concept um, of uh, Old Testament theology uh, that we're going to spend the rest of our morning on. Okay, the, the date of the book continues to be debated by people that like to debate things that don't matter. Uh, suggested dates span the period from right after the division of the kingdoms in 930 all the way down into the late post-exilic period. Uh, the most likely time is the time that it appears to be, which would be in the, the early 8th century, the early 700s BC. Uh, the reasons for that are technical. Uh, the, the great powers of the time are not mentioned. And so we don't hear about Assyria, which had not invaded the north yet when Joel wrote. We hear nothing at all about Babylon or about Persia, and both of those would have been mentioned in either the exilic or post-exilic period. Uh, so probably it's before any of those. Secondly, Joel is included with the other 8th century prophets. So Hosea uh, and Amos and Jonah are all 8th century prophets. Uh, they come uh, before uh, Isaiah. Uh, there is some mention of the minor powers in Joel. So Philistia, Tyre and Sidon, Greece. Uh, in uh, uh, the slide that you see, uh, the picture on the left is from one of the uh, Greek cities out in the Mediterranean. I believe it's on the island of Cyprus uh, near Paphos. 
uh, on the, uh, the upper right is the city of Tyre, uh, which is in modern Lebanon. So Tyre and Sidon and the Greece and the, those were all free and doing their thing, along with, uh, with Edom and Egypt and the Sabaeans and there's a variety of others. Uh, and what uh, Joel is going to be talking about is a, uh, a coming event. Uh, the occasion of his little letter is a locust plague. Now, this little guy uh, is not a, not a real locust. I got very close to him in order to get this picture. Uh, uh, he's uh, in America, we call this a grasshopper. Uh, but if you take a grasshopper and blow him up to the size of this screen, that's the size of a locust. Uh, a locust is a great big grasshopper. And typically locusts uh, come as plagues. Uh, so Joel wrote his, uh, his three chapter book in response to a locust plague, which had severely disrupted the economy. So a terrible plague and the economy is taking a nosedive and everybody is suffering and there's not enough food. So in the midst of the catastrophe, Joel saw destruction uh, from the Lord. Uh, this is judgment uh, from God on the people of Judah. So although God had blessed Judah during this time, the people had become complacent. The faith had degenerated. It was mostly formality. Uh, Joel told the people that the locust plague was a warning of a greater judgment to come unless they repented and turned again to follow the Lord. So we see at least two uh, uh, judgment times. There's the judgment of the locusts, which is a warning of a much bigger, badder coming judgment time, the judgment of the Assyrians. And, uh, Joel uses the term uh, the day of the Lord in order to, um, uh, to uh, describe uh, this judgment. Uh, the outline of Joel is very simple. Uh, there's two things that are going to happen in the day of the Lord. One is desolation and the other is deliverance. Uh, blessing and curse. Uh, something uh, something bad and something good. So the desolation is the judgment of God in the day of the Lord. And Joel says this locust plague is like the day of the Lord. And that here comes judgment, but afterwards will come God's deliverance if you repent. Uh, so there's uh, there's this uh, this pattern of desolation uh, or uh, judgment and blessing or deliverance in the day of the Lord. Every place that we see this term, and in the Old Testament, it, it's often called the day of the Lord. Sometimes it's called the day of the Lord's vengeance. Uh, sometimes it's called the day of wrath. Sometimes it's simply called that day. Uh, it's looking at um, a, a judgment that is coming at the end of history. Sometimes there is an intermediate day of the Lord, which is a specific judgment, still historical. Uh, uh, in, uh, in Joel, there is the uh, immediate desolation of the locust plague in the first 15 verses, but then a shift to still more trouble by means of a drought. But in chapter 2, the desolation of the day of the Lord looks toward something that is even worse that is going to happen. Uh, a, uh, uh, a, a judgment kind of like locusts, but more like an Assyrian invasion. Uh, and then this section finishes up in uh, verses 12 through 17 with a call to repent. Uh, most everything that we see in, uh, uh, in the prophets 
uh, that uh, that speaks of judgment is a call to repentance. Repent for the day of the Lord is at hand. Okay, there's a day of judgment coming right away. Therefore, repent so as to escape the day of the Lord. One of the great uh, images to have in our minds of uh, uh, God's pattern of judgment and salvation is the universality, the big circle of the wrath of God, of the judgment of God. It is universally deserved that is coming on the whole nation or the whole world or the whole earth. Everybody is involved in this day of judgment. In the midst of that day of judgment, some will be delivered. So repent so that you might be a part of the delivered few. That's the first part of this, uh, this book. Uh, the second part of uh, the book, well, I won't get there quite yet, but I will soon. Uh, I need to, to talk about the, uh, the day of the Lord uh, in a little different way. The, there are three viewpoints that uh, Joel has. Uh, a lot of the books of the Old Testament, a lot of the prophets, uh, will only speak of the day of the Lord as eschatological, that is, in the end time. Uh, Joel develops the concept of the day of the Lord in quite a bit of detail. Uh, he says there is a very near day of the Lord happening right now, which is the locust plague. The locust plague is judgment from God. Uh, you need to repent so as to escape the locust plague. In the middle distance, there's a major day of the Lord coming. This will be the Assyrian invasion. And the Assyrians are spoken of as a great army. It almost sounds like the Assyrians are locusts, or sometimes it sounds like the locusts are a great foreign army. Uh, and God is using, in the near stage, this locust plague, and in the farther stage, the Assyrian army doing their political thing, doing the uh, geopolitical oppression that the Assyrians did, as a means of executing the wrath of God. I want to emphasize that for a moment. Typically, when uh, God sends uh, wrath on the earth, as in the flood of Noah. Uh, he uses uh, great natural events or uh, widespread political events. Uh, the, uh, the nations go to war and one falls and another becomes triumphant and tyrannical and bad things happen in the world. Often those things are sent literally as a judgment from God. That's the message of Joel. Uh, the Assyrians were not good people. They were not godly people. Uh, they, they were not knowingly assisting God in anything. And yet God used the evil Assyrian people in order to judge his own chosen people, uh, Israel. Uh, and this is, the, this is the prediction. The Assyrian invasions are going to come. And then uh, Joel shifts in by, the, uh, by the third chapter. Uh, the, uh, the Lord shifts, well, actually, the, uh, the second chapter, beginning verse 12 and beyond. Uh, yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts not your garments. These people were formalists. They were rending their garments as a means of uh, repentance. Uh, what uh, Joel says is, uh, stop tearing your clothing. Uh, tear your heart. Uh, I, what I want to see is a broken heart. Uh, if, if your sin really bothers you, change. 
do something about it that, uh, that we all care about. Uh, blow the trumpet in Zion, uh, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly in uh, verse 15. Uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 2, toward the end, verse 26, it shall come to pass afterwards. Here's a, uh, here's a verse that uh, is going to pop up in the New Testament. That I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and earth and blood and fire and columns of smoke. By the time we get to the end of chapter two, we've got a prediction of a, a time of a great blessing and of great judgment for Israel leading up to the eternal state. Uh, the... Uh, the Old Testament has a very long view of history. Uh, this is what we mean by eschatology. Now, this term, the day of the Lord, uh, is a key concept. I'll give you a, a little chart here that maybe will be helpful. Perhaps we can uh, uh, get, a, get a little bit of a look at this. The day of the Lord pattern that we found it, find in the Old Testament uh, prophets looks like this. Uh, there is an end time coming. The day of the Lord is uh, something that we find in virtually all of the prophets uh, in one way or another. Typically, this is a time of judgment followed by blessing. Uh, the classic Old Testament themes of uh, blessing and curse that we introduced in the book of Genesis uh, come to their conclusion in history with the outworking of the curse in a time of great judgment and the outworking of blessing in the time of the kingdom age. Uh, the kingdom age is looking at a, at a time for Israel particularly when Messiah the King will reign over all of the earth from Jerusalem. Uh, and he will reign for a long period that will eventually become the eternal state or heaven. The, the kingdom of earth becomes the kingdom of heaven. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, we're given uh, a different set of, uh, uh, of terms. The, the New Testament calls the judgment period uh, the tribulation. Uh, the, uh, the kingdom in the New Testament is often, or well, it's uh, once in the book of Revelation, uh, labeled the uh, millennium. It's a thousand years long, a thousand years while Satan is bound. We continue to get more and more details along the way, but but we know that it is this. The book of uh, uh, Daniel uh, gives a seven-year length to the uh, tribulation or judgment period. The uh, uh, tribulation seven is actually the 70th seven in uh, a sequence of years that form the outline of uh, uh, the time of, uh, uh, of Israel at the end. And the time of the Gentiles also counts down to the same period. The church age happens between the time of Christ and the day of the Lord itself. The day of the Lord is actually a, uh, a period with an emphasis on Israel. So it's judgment on Israel, and by the way, the rest of the world, and a blessing on Israel, the blessing of the kingdom, which will also, incidentally, be a kingdom over all of the world. The church is not mentioned during the day of the Lord in the Old Testament. Uh, in the New Testament, we're introduced to the concept of the rapture. The rapture is the doctrine that the church, whoever is alive at 
the end of the church age will go up into heaven uh, and the tribulation will happen and the millennial kingdom will happen with the church age believers in heaven. Uh, so I'm good with that. I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, uh, the uh, specific details are things that we argue about, uh, but it's, uh, it's still coming. Um, the, uh, the term end times, by the way, or last days, I don't have either of those here, uh, refers to all of the time uh, from the time of Christ to the eternal state. So if people ask you, do you think we're in the last days? The correct answer is, of course. We've been in the last days for 2,000 years, and frankly, always will be up to the end of time. Uh, so that, that's not a very specific term. The term day of the Lord, however, is a very specific technical term. Uh, so we should make a distinction when, uh, when we're talking about what's coming. All of this depends on uh, what we call a literal understanding of the, uh, of the prophetic scriptures. If we understand the prophetic scriptures in the same way as we understand the historical scriptures or the poetic scriptures, if we interpret literally, we're going to come up with this pattern. And the, the pattern of prophetic uh, scripture lays out a series of events, many of which have not happened yet. Uh, and so we believe that there is a, a future component the second coming of Christ will in fact happen. The kingdom age will in fact be set up. Uh, that, that makes we conservative Christians fairly unique, uh, even in the Christian world, because we believe that the Bible is telling us the truth, not only about our salvation, but also about the history of God's creation. The last uh, little bit of the uh, the book of uh, the book of Joel, deliverance of the land, in uh, chapter two, interesting eighteen through twenty seven speak of the uh, the deliverance of uh, the land itself, uh, Aretz Israel. Uh, this this land of Israel continues to be important to God. Uh, it continues to be the focus of biblical prophecy, long after the Gentiles begin to trample it. Uh, the, uh, the Assyrians will come rampaging through, but they won't be permanent residents. Uh, after the Assyrians, the Babylonians uh, will take up residence in Jerusalem and will take political control of uh, that land. And from that time until the present, the Gentile nations have had their presence on the Temple Mount uh, to this day. Uh, and so we are in that period of Gentile domination. But God prophesies that in the end time, there will be a deliverance of the land of Israel. Uh, I believe that the, uh, uh, the existence, the continued existence and the growth and development of the nation of Israel since 1948, uh, actually for uh, 70 years before then, with the return of Jewish people to the land of Israel, uh, is a part of God's preparation for the full deliverance of the land itself. It continues to be the promised land and continues to be the place that God intends to bless his people. Secondly, there is a deliverance for the remnant of Israel. We've talked about that word remnant before. It becomes more significant in the prophetic literature. The remnant uh, is always that minority of Israel who chose to follow God and who chose to look forward to the coming of the Messiah. So today we would call these people Messianic Jews. In order to be a part of the remnant, you have to be Jewish and you have to be a follower of the Messiah. So Messianic Jews. 
Uh, and uh, there are quite a lot of those in Israel. There are quite a lot of them in, uh, in Europe and in America. The third thing that we see is a deliverance from the heathen nations, from the Gentile nations. The ending of the time of the Gentiles will require a great battle. Uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the Bible describes a, a battle of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, this may be called the Battle of Armageddon. But there's a tremendous battle that takes place at the end of history that concludes the time of the tribulation uh, and introduces the second coming of Christ. And at this point, Israel is delivered from Gentile domination. Uh, in chapter, uh, chapter 3 of Joel, from 17 to 21, we see the completion of the, uh, of the deliverance. The salvation of the nation of Israel is completed, and she enjoys a thousand years of the uh, reign of Messiah on earth, and then eternity uh, in heaven. Uh, worshiping God. So that's a that's a rough outline of uh, actually it's a it's an outline of biblical eschatology. Uh, there's a lot of individual points here uh, that become a part of the uh, of the larger scheme of thing. I'm going to stop the share here. Uh, biblical prophecy, which is what we're going to be looking at for most of the rest of the course. Uh, is God's message to his people at the time uh, that also has a message for all of the rest of us, for all of the rest of history. Uh, God knows the end from the beginning. And we don't always know where we are along that process, but we are somewhere. There's a trajectory of God from the beginning to the end of history. The high point is the cross of Christ. The beginning is God's creation out of nothing. The end is God's new creation of a new heaven and a new earth, peopled by the redeemed. You and I and the uh, uh, redeemed people of Israel uh, in heaven forever, worshiping God. Uh, between those things are a series of events, a, a trajectory. Uh, God knows each point along the way from the beginning. And he uh, gives us an outline of those events in biblical prophecy. Much of Prophetic scripture is open to argument. It's open to interpretation. Uh, I insist on uh, two fundamental principles. One is that the words on the page need to mean what they say. Sometimes we don't quite understand what they say, but we need to let the words mean what they say. That's one, the literal interpretation. Two is that because of literal interpretation, the nation of Israel and God's plans for the nation of Israel are separate in Scripture from the church. The church is the people of God created on the day of Pentecost uh, and made up of all peoples, including the Messianic Jews, uh, who will exist during the entire church age, however long that lasts. And the church is not Israel. The church doesn't, doesn't own land in the nation of Israel. We have no earthly heritage. Our, our treasure is in heaven. Israel's heritage is the land of Israel, and then eventually an eternity with God in heaven. Uh, but only for the remnant that believes. For the church, every believer has an eternity in heaven and has a part of this kingdom age. Uh, so there are, there are two different heritages. Uh, there's, there's a mixture. There are times when we're on the same page together, and other times when things are very different. So I insist on those two principles. One, there's 
never an excuse to fall short of the literal, plain, clear interpretation of Scripture. The words need to mean what they say. And secondly, Israel and the church are two different bodies of people, and God has a different purpose uh, for Israel and the church. In the Old Testament, we'll look primarily at God's plan for Israel. In the New Testament, we see God's plan for the church. Uh, um, those, once we take all of that apart, it becomes a, a fairly complicated prophetic outline, and I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, but the complexity of the plan is simply a result of um, the principles going in. If we interpret the Bible literally, we end up with a fairly complex plan. What makes biblical prophecy interesting today is that there are so many details falling into slots. There are so many things that today we can understand that were never clear 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 500 years ago. Many, many details of biblical prophecy finally make sense. On Monday, today is Wednesday, isn't it? On uh, Monday, we will continue with the book of Jonah, one of my favorite little books in the Old Testament. We'll only spend a few minutes with Jonah, but I love Jonah. Uh, and uh, that's where we'll be going next. I am going to... Uh,